Hi folks, Chris Martin here with another edition of Diplomacy Academy. Today, I want to talk about negotiations. And in a way, I want to revisit my initial episode on unintended consequences by looking at the way negotiations can lead to things that you don't want to happen and why it is so vital that you craft your messages in such a way as to narrow the possible outcomes that you might be achieving. That seems a little vague, so I'm going to go ahead and break it down with a couple of examples from a game that I played recently on PlayDiplomacy.com. Right out of the gate, Germany screws up his orders, and his fate is sealed. Italy postures pro-Austria, but then runs in on him, leading to big gains for Turkey. France and England join up, Russia and Turkey join up, but by the end of 1903, England owns St. Petersburg, France owns Munich, and Tunis. The early game is over as Austria is eliminated. In 1904, Italy cuts a deal with France and joins Team France-England, who push relentlessly through the middle of the board. Now, Russia keeps up the fight in the north, and Turkey keeps up the fight in the south. But unless there is a change in alliance structure, this is just a matter of time. And it turns out that RT are unable to do anything to shake the French, Italians, English. Turkey holds the Ionian until 1907, but eventually is driven back. Russia loses the motherland, makes a desperate bid to stay alive at Turkey's expense. At the end of the game, first Turkey and then Russia are eliminated. England and France end on 13, with Italy on 8, and the game is over. I was England in this game, and focusing on the negotiations here, I really want to look at the relationship between myself and Russia. This really drove the game for me, as I really wanted to work with Russia to DMZ Scandinavia so that I could move into the center of the board. But that didn't happen, and I think the initial mistake was mine, and then Russia took that mistake and compounded it and compounded it and just drove us to a position where there was no way that I was going to have anything to do with him for the rest of the game. That's not what you want to have happen in your negotiations, so let's take a look at how that came about. In this position, I have two builds in 1901, and I put down Army, London, Fleet Eddy. Maybe not the exact builds that Russia was looking for, but I've taken Norway with the fleet, didn't put the army there, so maybe he doesn't have that much to complain about. So he asks me, what are we going to do? And let's take a look at some of this press. You have to read from the bottom to the top here. So Russia sends me a message says, hey, what's the plan? And I look at the thing and I say, well, you know what? I want to go after Germany. Here's the most aggressive way that we can go after Germany possible. And in response, he says, okay, I'm fine with that. Let's do it. That's not how it turned out. Instead, I go through with those moves as suggested, but he walks into Norway. I say, if you thought I was going to attack you, how does moving to Norway help your position? He doesn't have a really good answer for that. But I say, look, you move out of Norway, we'll call it no harm, no foul, we'll get this bus back on the road. And he says, yes. I'm going to do that. So right before we get ready to process the fall, I go ahead and reach out to him. I don't want to fight you. Let's touch base and, and, and make sure that we're all good. He says, yes, I'm going to move out of Norway. We're re putting this relationship back on track. This was a bad choice I made. It's going to be like it never happened. You know, when I'm Russia, England always attacks me. I'm sorry. We can turn this boat around. And I'm left to wonder, should I take him at his word here, or should I go ahead and use the supported attack that I have to guarantee that I retake Norway and he doesn't profit from this? Now, I give this a lot of thought. I've got a lot of options here. But at the end of the day, with France having all armies, Germany functionally neutered, the only threat that I have is from Russia. So I decide, you know what, we're going to just guarantee that I do not lose Norway. I'm willing to deal with the consequences of that. In a face-to-face in -face game, we'd be at this point where 
Norway has to make this retreat, and the Russian player would have to make that decision with no negotiations. But online, that's not the case. And this is where really our relationship is shaped. So he lied to me about whether or not he was going to move to Norway, or whether he was going to go with me against Russia, against Germany, excuse me. And then he lied to me about walking out of Norway and, and repairing our relationship. So what he says and does now is going to have a, a big impact, but I'm looking at it through the lens of um, he's lied to me twice in a row. So let's see what he has to say. So this is fascinating, right? He's lied to me twice in a row, and when I've made the moves to to guarantee that he doesn't profit from that, he tries to turn around and spin it like I'm the one who has done something to betray him. This is definitely a corollary to that unintended antagonism. Like, what is he trying to do with this message? Does, does he really think that I have screwed him over? I'm going to go ahead and tailor my response to him, because what, what do I really want here? What I really want him to do is to not retreat to the Norwegian Sea. So what can I do to make that happen? That's my goal in this short term period here. I decide that the tactic I want to use here is to just call him on his bullshit and say, look, I'm probably wasting my time here, but if you're willing to do something for me, we can talk. Otherwise, let's just fight. because. I'm done having you lie to me. Now, when somebody's been lying to you and you basically call them on it, sometimes that can be the beginning of a, a much more productive relationship because it kind of gives them a chance to reset. And when you say is, especially in a situation like this, I want to see your move. If you do what I want you to do, then we can talk. Otherwise, then I know we're just fighting and let's fight. How does he respond? He gives me what I'm asking for. He says, fine. I'm going to go ahead and retreat to Sweden. Can I have Denmark? And yeah, let's look at the board here. I've got Skagerrak, I've got North Sea, I've got Helgoland Bight. Denmark is neutral and unowned, and, and I'm in Norway. So I, I've got to walk to St. Petersburg, I've got a supported attack on Sweden. Can he have Denmark? That's a really interesting choice here. What is he trying to accomplish by asking that question at this moment? It's not, if I retreat to Sweden, can I have Denmark? It's, I'm going to retreat to Sweden. Can I have Denmark? I don't know that I like that so much. And I'm thinking at this point, what greedy McGreedy pants, uh, ask, 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 ask. I don't think that's the right way to approach this. But in the spirit of like, well, let's have a conversation about it. This is how I respond. I'm not closing the door on that conversation, but like, why? I'm willing to offer you a dot, but it's going to be Berlin. I'm going to take the other dots. Uh, certainly, I'm going to take Denmark and Kiel. And if you're playing nice with me, you get to keep St. Petersburg and Sweden at the same time. It's kind of the implied subtext here, right? And I, I'm trying to say, hey, I'm looking out for the long term. Berlin is something you can hold. There's no way you're going to hold Denmark with me there. That's not a reasonable ask, right? And I think the mistake that Russia is making here is trying to negotiate as if he were in a position of strength. He's not. He's overwhelmed by the force that I have in the area. He's got one unit to my four. Now, he does have a little bit of negotiating space here because he can retreat to the Norwegian Sea. And that would be an inconvenience for me. But I think he massively overestimates the amount of inconvenience because he takes Eddie, I take Denmark and Sweden and St. Petersburg. And I just come back and I take Eddie back. And okay, a pirate fleet in the back lines is, is bad, but maybe not so bad. And it's certainly not enough of a, a, a threat that I'm worried about it in the least. Here's my pitch. You retreat to Sweden, and if you want to work with me, we'll get you into Berlin. How does he respond? His response is kind of making a joke about the threat that he poses. He says, ha ha, you know, hey, I'll be your friend if you let me have it, and you walk out of Scandinavia. Now, okay, he puts a little smiley emoticon after that, so, okay, that's a joke, right? But, like, it's a joke 
that he seems to mean seriously because look at his follow-up, right? The alternative is, I will mess with you. And yeah, you were nice to me, you wanted to be my friend, I'll leave you alone, he says, if you'll let me have Denmark. And I'm like, okay, no, we're done here. That's just like the end of the line for me. That's such an incredible uh, threat to make explicitly that I don't care. Let's fight. Um, now, as it turns out, he makes the decision that he can't, uh, he doesn't want to go down that road, and he does retreat to Sweden. That's basically what's on my mind as I go through 1903. Let's take a look at those moves. So here's the uh, build. Spring comes, and he doesn't go down to the Baltic Sea. Not working with me, and not working against me. Then in the fall, I just go ahead and I take St. Petersburg. I'm like, you know what? No, can't can't let that happen. Gotta have it. I'm making sure that he's not going to get a chance to build there because he, he crushes Austria. So this was a really good turn uh, for France and for England, and not a bad turn for Russia. And in fact, if I don't take St. Petersburg here, I've got a very different game on my hand because he certainly builds there, right? And then maybe I have a much harder time taking it later. It's at this point he really puts the final nail in his coffin as far as I'm concerned, as far as our diplomatic relationships are concerned. And he doesn't do it with a message to me. He does it with a message to France. Russia has forwarded uh, my negotiations with him to France. And for me, I have to say, that's just the end of the road. Forwarding press is such a bad idea. Uh, this is exactly why it's such a bad idea. Now, of course, anything that you say in a negotiation can be used against you, but there's a big difference between hearsay and here is what he wrote. That's just a terrible way to play the game. It's, it's really the nuclear option of negotiations. If it works and if it's so powerful that it breaks up the alliance that you're fighting and creates a real dynamic board change, then then yeah, okay, it's justified. I'm, I'm not saying that this is against the spirit of the game. No, no, no. I'm just saying if it doesn't work, and it didn't work in this case, then you have just done yourself some irreparable harm because you've demonstrated now that you're not a person who can be worked with. Because if you're forwarding one person's press, everybody assumes you're forwarding everyone's press. It is just completely toxic. Now, there are exceptions to this. You'll note that France forwarded me Russia's message. And I don't have the same reaction towards France. Oh, he can't be worked with. Inside of an alliance where you're working with each other, saying, hey, I got this from this other person, especially when it really undermines that person as a partner. Oh, this was a really good piece of negotiation from France because there is no way that Russia and I are getting our act together and getting back on board, which is, of course, what France wants. The lesson here is not that you shouldn't be trying to break up the alliance that's attacking you. That's exactly what Russia should be doing. He's got to try and get France to turn on me. He's got to try and get me to turn on France. I could go on and do more of a breakdown of the tactics, but I want to focus on the negotiations here because this is a failure of negotiations on both sides. My objective is to not be in a fight with Russia, and that fails. And in fact, it fails so far that I get sucked all the way into owning everything from St. Petersburg to, to Smyrna. Um, that's how badly my attempts to negotiate with Russia fail. Where did I go wrong? The first mistake that I made was making too big of an ask. I misjudged what Russia would be willing to go for in this position and did not accurately have a read on him. I needed to make something else happen where I was a little bit more conservative. And so he starts from negotiating with me from a position, oh, if this guy is just trying to talk me out of my dots. So 
then he's got to be surprised when I actually go through with it and he ends up in Norway. He's like, well, maybe I can just get away with this. Maybe he's going to believe whatever I tell him here. And, you know, I continue to, to try and ask him. And in that moment, when I say, are you really going to move out? And he says, yes, I'm really going to move out. And I go, yeah, no, I don't believe you. That's a failure of negotiations. And we needed to have a reset there. And maybe I needed to be honest with him about what I really wanted, but maybe there just was no way for us to get on the same page. And uh, I could have just said, you know what, look, no, I'm taking your dots, and um, if you want to work on something in the future, great, but right now we're fighting. Instead, I kept opening the door, and I kept trying to have that conversation about what we might be able to do together, and I think that never really resonated with him. Um, when we get into 1904, we had some press exchanges where he was like, well, of course I'm fighting you. You took St. Petersburg from me. I'm going to come and take it back, and I'm going to drag you down with me. And I was like, yeah, okay. You're not going to take it back, and you're not going to drag me down with you because I've, I've got massive superiority of numbers over here, and so now you've made an enemy out of me, and I've just got to kill you. So the that dynamic right where russia and i never connected started with me making the wrong ask i said let's go attack germany together and i meant it i, I wanted to do it and i i didn't get it by end so it's not like a failure in communications is ever all just one way and although i really broke his position down and what he was saying and why that was wrong uh, i don't want to to suggest that there there wasn't a mistake here on my part there there were several the the forwarding of the press thing, I want to say again, I think that's a terrible idea. I think you want to do that so rarely. You want to be so sure that it's going to have the effect that you want, because if you don't, I mean, it, it blows up in your face. If you're dying anyway, I guess maybe you don't have anything to lose from it, but it, it's not going to get you what you want if all you're trying to do is to change the dynamic. It's just revealing yourself as an unreliable partner. And that's what I got for this one. If you're interested, uh, I'd be curious to know why you think I didn't go for a solo in this game. You look around 1906, 1907, slow that down there. I had a chance. Could have stabbed. Why didn't I go for it? What do you think? Um, anything else? Please, I'd love to hear your feedback. Like this video if you liked it. Uh, subscribe to my channel if you are interested in seeing more videos about diplomacy. Hopefully they'll be at a, an improved cadence over the summer here. Until next time, I'm Chris Martin, and I'll stab you soon.